In terms of uh, how uh, circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA or some of these liquid biopsies are informing care in patients with colorectal cancer, uh, as, as Riley pointed out, the stage doesn't make a difference. Uh, I would say for the most part, uh, for patients with stage 2, it's a nuanced, complicated decision where we have to look at the pathology report, multiple risk factors. Uh, the first thing we often tell our patients is that the actual benefit of chemotherapy in stage 2 is uh, small and we're probably over-treating a lot of our patients. Uh, it's great to have a randomized trial in this place. The, the dynamic study that was presented at ASCO and also published in the New England Journal showed that by going with a CTDNA-directed approach, uh, you were achieving the same outcomes, but only half as many people got chemotherapy. Conversely, uh, if somebody has low risk by pathology, by other traditional guidelines in the U.S. that will follow NCCN in terms of uh, subtle things on pathology, that if absent, that you could forego chemotherapy, but post-op if the circulating tumor DNA is positive, well, that person is not cured. So I think the big difference to understand between pathologic high-risk features and an actual blood test post-op that is telling that it's circulating tumor DNA are, it's a very different uh, meaning and interpretation. So while the other risk factors are more about predicting if recurrence were to happen, uh, a circulating tumor DNA, like in this uh, study, a tumor-informed circulating tumor DNA, is informing the patient as well as the physician that this person is not cured. Uh, circulating tumor DNA has a half-life of a few hours, so if it's persisting days or weeks post-op, that person is not cured. Every single study in stage two has looked into what's the outcome if you don't do anything about it. Uh, those patients will pretty much recur within typically a two-year time period. And what the dynamic study showed and also the bespoke that uh, you know it's it's not like a static variable that you can convert CTDNA positivity to negativity. Uh, in fact, uh, that's the subset of patient population that one potentially could be more aggressive about. Uh, so. As an example, in the dynamic study too, uh, even though half as many people got chemotherapy, but there was more oxaliplatin use. And the reason for that is, in somebody who's not cured, you want to give them the best chance. So uh, outside of, of course, using it in clinical trials, uh, in an actual clinical practice, in a lower stage two, if you have somebody who is CTNA positive, it can inform the decision to do adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and I would say uh, it's probably about time that we include this as one more aid in the decision toolbox uh, for our patients with stage 2 colon cancer. And in terms of what to do with CTDNA positivity results, uh, once you have a patient, for example, who is in uh, surveillance who's already received adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, we have also uh, published an editorial with ASCO on the same subject. And uh, the short answer is I don't think anybody truly knows because there have been, been actual trials in this space. So a lot of this is through prospective studies and also expert opinions on what to do. Uh, in general, I draw analogies to what would you do if this patient had a rising CEA and there are papers going back to the early 2000s about uh, how a rising CEA, for example, should prompt imaging to begin with. Uh, if somebody already had cross-sectional imaging to begin with, the question then comes up is, uh, did you consider functional imaging in terms of a PET CT scan that may pick up an area of avidity that may not be enlarged by size, so often it's not uncommon to have a node that was uh, uh, PET avid uh, in the distribution chain or higher up that uh, was not picked up by CT, but the PET caught it uh, in terms of an oligometastatic recurrence. And then in the right patient context, the two other places to look at is an MRI for a patient with uh, liver metastases where often a CT can miss uh, lesions. And then for the high-risk T4 patients, uh, it's not uncommon to have peritoneal recurrences. So uh, it is usually uh, between these three uh, locations, uh, often you will find uh, um, the persistence of disease. Uh, so early cadence of imaging, more frequent follow-ups, and then uh, changing the modality of imaging uh, in a consultation with a surgeon sometimes are things that one would consider if somebody is CTNA positive in the surveillance setting. And, and one other final thing I do want to point out is there are trials in this space that are actively recruiting. So they are looking for patients who are CTNA positive, who yet have not radiographically recurred, who might be candidate for some of these vaccine-based approaches, MRD-guided trials. So while that may not be relevant from a day-to-day -day clinical practice, some of these trials are available throughout the country, at least in the United States, so, uh, and uh, also in some of the centers of excellence globally as well. So trials are always something that we look for our patients, uh, something to kind of keep in mind as well.
as a secondary goal. In some ways, uh, the bespoke study and some of the other studies in the space have provided benchmarks for what to expect for CTNA positivity. There is uh, minimal discussion, there is consensus overall that uh, anybody who is CTNA positive, these are patients who uh, recur uh, pretty much within a matter of time, within one to two years, uh, depending on how high risk they are. Uh, conversely, patients who are CTNA positive, uh, as the assays get uh, better in terms of picking up uh, it's simplistically a deeper dive or low volume of circulating tumor DNA, um, the, the molecules that are uh, being picked up uh, earlier on as the assays are improving. Even the same company's assay is not the same as it was a few years ago. So there are multiple assays in this space, but also it's important to kind of realize that there are uh, the same assay may or may not be the same as it was uh, if you look at some of the studies a few years ago. So if a patient um, has uh, uh, circulating tumor DNA um, uh, in terms of um, uh, positivity or negativity, the way uh, it can influence by knowing these benchmarks is uh, what to tell to the patient. So uh, if I see a patient with stage 2 or stage 3 and as we are ordering the test, uh, the first thing that we should talk to the patient about uh, regardless of uh, CTDNA is uh, the test that's being uh, offered, what to expect. So uh, in stage 2 and stage 3, knowing that these updated numbers are anywhere from 7 to 8 percent in the stage 2 uh, and about uh, three times more in, in stage 3 up to like a quarter, uh, kind of gives an idea uh, to what to expect from the uh, test results before even they come back. Uh, and then, of course, the next question is, uh, what are you going to do about it? So, as we discussed earlier, uh, knowing if a CTDNA uh, positive patient, let's say for stage two, was opting for no chemotherapy, or if that was a decision based on pathology, that decision would be overturned once you have the results of the CTDNA back. Uh, it kind of also corroborates uh, based on our previous experiences of what are the recurrence rates for stage one, two, and three. The positivity rates are also kind of in many ways informing about the recurrence, uh, recurrence risk uh, down the line. So uh, it's helpful clinically on a day-to-day -day basis when we talk to our patients, but then it also is helpful as we design trials. It's helpful to know what is the positivity rate without any intervention post-op and how that rate could uh, be improved, uh, whether it's some sort of new adjuvant therapy, there is presence in other studies like multiple myeloma, where now that's been recognized as a surrogate endpoint. We're not there with colorectal cancer yet, but uh, there is informed guidance from FDA about how to use these endpoints. So, of course, in the clinic, it's helpful to have the discussion regarding uh, with the patient as to uh, the question comes up is, you know, do, do I still have leftover cancer in my body? Am I cured, not cured? Uh, should I really do chemotherapy, not do chemotherapy? So I think that it, it uh, doesn't replace the clinical decision making, but it provides a very uh, good uh, aid in the toolbox in that decision making, but then also keeping in mind that clinical trials and early readout of endpoints and with all the data that we are presenting in the new adjuvant setting, uh, potentially this can act as uh, not necessarily to replace the traditional surrogates of disease free survival, but it can also be incorporated in some of these new adjuvant studies uh, where you can use um, MRD as an endpoint. If you know, like in this study of over 1,000 people, with stage two and three colon cancer that the rates of positivity are anywhere from eight to 25% for two and three respectively. And if you had a therapy that cleared CTDNA, clearly you know that this is a positive signal that you can chase. As I see a patient with um, uh, colon cancer for adjuvant therapy, uh, it's an informed shared decision making uh, about uh, what are we going to do uh, from an adjuvant chemotherapy standpoint. Uh, I, I do want to put a plug in for some of the NCI and uh, cooperative group uh, uh, CTDNA directed therapy studies. Uh, so one of them is uh, Circulate that's asking the question of escalation of chemotherapy for the CTDNA positive and the de-escalation of chemotherapy for the low risk stage three patients because we are probably over treating these patients. That's the first thing that is written in the guidelines for stage two and probably uh, some of the stage two patients have uh, worse prognosis than some of the lower stage three. So we know that um, you know the, the, these are patients, a lot of them who are probably already cured. That's the first thing I tell you. The patient says that the most important thing to cure you is the surgery which has been done. Now the question is, you know, we need to increase the number of people who can be cured with whatever chemotherapy that might be in plan based on your pathology. So CTDNA can be integrated to help with that decision making, but also like for any tests, uh, as some of the experts earlier at ASCO also concluded, you need to have a discussion about what are you going to do differently if uh, the results um, uh, come back positive or negative. So 
uh, for my high risk stage 3 like a T4 and 2 disease where I'm uh, absolutely going to recommend to give chemotherapy. I tell patients before even the results come back, the CTNA negativity, we're not there yet to conclusively say that um, I'm not going to give you chemotherapy. The data is very provocative and actually let me help inform enrolling in trials, uh, more ethical and more informed, but um, you have to realize that there is beyond the assay, there is also the biology and shedding issue, serial testing can help, so that part has to be individualized and uh, discussion has to happen before the test results come back, otherwise there is confusion about what the goals are. Uh, again, for, as we discussed earlier, for stage 2 low risk, if you're positive, it may change the decision for giving chemotherapy. Uh, and then. Uh, I think regardless of the role as a predictive marker or therapy decision making, one big question that comes up is uh, uh, in the surveillance setting or also uh, as an aid to prognostic aiding, uh, there's no doubt about the fact that this is the strongest prognostic tool that we have that can tell us about the current risk regardless of the treatment plan. So even if we go with the prognosis story, there are patients who would, want, who would uh, want to know uh, what are the odds uh, of me being cancer free at two years with what you know. So I think it, uh, that information is very powerful in terms of knowing that uh, initial results from a year ago when we presented the data with about 600 patients to the new update uh, at ASCO GI in 2025 with over 1,000 patients that uh, being ca uh, cancer-free, disease-free at about 90 plus percent still holds for the CTNA negative. So that's a very strong number compared to the ones who are CTNA positive, it drops to like a third. Uh, so. That information piece is, uh, is helpful uh, to inf help inform the patients uh, to those who want to know. At the same time, there are some patients who would rather not know, and that's where I think that decision or discussion has to happen before testing occurs. The, the bigger question that we're still dabbling is, you know, uh, how confidently can we say that some, to somebody who's CTD negative uh, that you're cured, that you don't need chemotherapy? Uh, I think while the DFS signal of being cancer-free is, is very proactive, it's not 100%. Uh, so it has to, like we won't necessarily not give chemotherapy if the guidelines in a particular patient recommended chemotherapy, but at least it helps inform that if you had a de-escalation arm like in the circular trial, uh, initially when circular trial was being designed and it was open, there were concerns about uh, colleagues of mine not putting patients on the study who said that you know it would be unethical because I'm not comfortable in not giving chemotherapy to somebody who's CTD negative because they are, for example, stage 3, but again we know there is lower stage 3, there is higher stage 3, and this kind of data that continues to inform that uh, as long as you can present this information to the patient that um, if you are CTD negative, some of the numbers are showing that the odds of uh, the proportion of people who are cancer free is, is uh, upwards of 90-92%. Is that something that would align with uh, you being randomized to no treatment versus uh, uh, you know uh, three months of uh, uh, whatever chemotherapy might be uh, decided between the treating physician and the patient. So that part, um, at least, it can definitely inform uh, decision into participating in those trials. I think uh, as we get more down on those randomized trials as opposed to studies where uh, these decisions were uh, individualized based on treating physician, uh, patient care, and there might be reasons why somebody didn't opt for uh, chemotherapy. So. Um, all I can say right now is that it's very provocative to see that there is a minimal difference. You're not losing out uh, if somebody was CTN negative. So, um, again, not to replace our decision making, but uh, as a strong prognostic and maybe potentially a predictive tool uh, in the near future, at least the participation in ongoing trials will help inform uh, how much um, this can add uh, into the decision making for adjuvant chemotherapy for patients with colorectal cancer.